Hi, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session, Rumination with Andrew. Thank you so much for joining as we are about to discuss a very topical matter. Now, this morning I have a little bug in my throat, so maybe I'm not as clear um, as I usually am. So please listen carefully. Now, this morning we are going to talk about, and let me just say perhaps it's going to be reaching you in the afternoon, <clears throat> at night, or whenever it reaches you in your neck of the woods, right? But it's being published right now. Now, we shall be talking this um, right now, <laughs> let me not use the time of the day, about you know the whole question of, can Jamaicans really help the police to control crime and violence that is in Jamaica? And that has been a very important question um, that has been asked. Um, I think that for so many years, people have been wondering that we need to inform, we need to work with the police, we need to have um, community policing in Jamaica, because that is one of the aspects of policing that we lack there. Um, that is something that needs to be explored. But what is happening, it seems to me, is that people do not trust the police. They think the police are connected uh, with the state, which obviously they are because they work for the state and they have to be very careful. So if they see a crime, criminal activity, and if they had trust in the police. Many Jamaicans perhaps would have gone to report it. We also had in the 1990s, I believe, you know, the dance hall music. There was a particular dance or dance hall artist who was talking about, you know, informer fidead, right? That you should kill informants um, because that is what they um, should do because they actually go and they snitch on people who might have committed a crime or something. And I think that because our dance hall culture is also linked to crime and violence, then that could have been what the dance hall artist was intimating at, that people who report on people who commit, you know, gruesome crime, gruesome criminal activities should be killed, should be murdered. There was a song, right, in uh, sometimes in the 1990s. And in the 1990s, we also had an upscale in crime and violence. Now, the Gleaner is reporting a story here of three people who were actually killed last Tuesday. And they're suggesting the super, the senior superintendent of police says Mobay triple murder could have been prevented if residents gave cops info. So the criminal activity was actually enacted in Montego Bay. So we have here a senior superintendent of police Aaron Samuels, commend commanding officer for the St. James Police Division, addressing the monthly meeting of the St. James Municipal Corporation on Thursday, July 11, 2024. Now, Senior Superintendent of Police Aaron Samuels believes that last Tuesday's triple murder in Montego Bay, St. James, could have been presented, could have been pre prevented rather, if residents had been more willing to provide information to the police prior to the incident. So here the senior superintendent of police is suggesting that had the people, had the citizens provided information to the police, that triple murder could have been averted, could have been prevented, something that is interesting. And that is why I'm opening the question, can Jamaicans, you know, assist the police in putting a dent in criminal activities, something that needs to be further investigated and explored? Addressing last Thursday's month sitting of the St. James Municipal Corporation, Samuels, who is the head of the St. James Police Division, stated that the shooting deaths of 62-year-old David West, 26-year-old Rashawn Williams, and 17-year-old student Jaden Bennett stemmed from an incident on Monday night of which the police had not been informed until after Tuesday's deadly attack. From July or from June 9th to July 9th, approximately 30 days, we went without a murder in St. James. That's that's interesting. So from June 9th to July 9th, a month, approximately 30 days, we went without a murder in St. James. So that was approximately a month. That was good. If that's true with what they're telling us, we can't always accept what they say because sometimes murders are not reported and sometimes our leaders are not truthful what they say. But if that is the case, if, if um, between June, June 9 and July 9th, there wasn't a murder rest registered in St. James, I think that was, that's commendable. That's how it should be, but um, that's not how it is. And when, you know, one of the things about Jamaica too, 
when you have like a risk a respite right so when you have just like a break you know um in something then it comes back with full vengeance so let us say that you have a month without crime and balance then the other month is going to be you know you're going to have lots of murders and this is where we move from one extreme to the next that is the state of jamaica and that is what we have to discuss that we can't always you know gloat over when we have no murders because you know the when it comes back right which is a very brief period and then when it comes back it comes back with full vengeance and that is always what happens in ja now, so that's what the police was saying. He says, part of the issue we are facing is that the public needs to work with the police and provide us with information. There was an incident that happened Monday night. If we had had additional information prior to that, if we had known all about it, all of this would have been avoided. We are asking residents to work with the police so we can ensure your safety and security. That is the whole thesis of the article. So now we are suggesting that the police, that residents have to work with the police. Right? That is what he is intimating, that residents have to work with the police to ensure that they are protected. But what if the citizens, what if the residents are not comfortable, do not feel safe to report what they see to the police? How are we gonna combat this sort of distrust between the police, between state forces and citizens, because the police are also corrupt. And in some cases, we understand the police also are involved in criminal activities. Because when you have a state, for example, police officer who barely makes any decent, he doesn't make a decent salary, he or she does not make a decent salary. When he or she is exposed to criminal activities, then in some cases, they might be involved, you know, they might get themselves involved so that they can be paid. Because in many, in many times, there is some sort of monetary reward in these, uh, with these criminal activities. Because we understand that even our young men are being paid to kill. Because criminality in Jamaica is also a business. It's a corporation. And that is why we're not seeing, you know, a dent in criminal activities, because that is how people eat. And so the system set up. That is how the system is designed. And we tend not to want to confront this very serious um, reality. I was speaking to somebody last week and I was telling them that Jamaica is a criminal state. And her response was that, yeah, um, well, she doesn't want to say that because, you know, um, she can't say that because, you know, just not pretending as if we are intellectuals. So we can't say that because, you know, trying to make excuses for the state. Now, the reason for which she says she can't say that is because she believes that not all of them are. And we agree with that. We can agree with that not all policemen and police women are criminals or are engaged in criminal activities. What we can say, however, is that the system is criminal and most of them are. Because if most of them weren't, and if the system weren't criminal, then you would not have had the lawlessness that we're seeing in Jamaica. And you would not have the level of criminality that we're witnessing there. It is simple. This is nothing that is, you know, rocket science. And sometimes I wonder how are people reason and they want to reason in this herd like mentality. And because that's what they hear other people who sound like they're intellectual saying, then you are going to repeat that same narrative. Oh, yeah. You, you think you sound balanced, but you're not balanced because it, it doesn't take it doesn't take any intellectual mind to see that if our system was not a criminal system, then you would not have the high level of criminality you see in Jamaica. Now, I'm not suggesting here that you would not have criminal activities in Jamaica, right? But you would not see this high level that we are witnessing right now. If the police officers weren't as corrupt and have this propensity 
to be engaged in criminal activities, the citizens would be informing the police about what they see or about what you know they have witnessed. But at this juncture of the history and at this present moment in Jamaica, in, in this climate of crime and violence, the hostile climate, this hostile climate of crime and violence that is evident in Jamaica, I do not think that the citizens are going to be comfortable with reporting what they have witnessed, what they have seen with the police. So what we're going to see, we're going to see a continuation of crime and violence. Because again, even the police officers do not want to face up with reality. They do not want to confront the reality that the citizens do not trust them. Right? Because there has never been a culture of community policing in Jamaica. There has never been a community of, a culture rather, of police, of community police rather in Jamaica, community policing in Jamaica. There has never been. So people are not accustomed to community policing. And as a result of that, they are seeing the police as their enemies. And not because the police is intrinsically, is inherently uh, an enemy, but because, you know, the, the police, what they're involved with, right? The activities in which they are engaged sometimes create that enmity between the citizen and the police force, members of the police force. These are things that we have to understand and we are not trying to understand them. So don't tell me that the system is not a criminal system because it is a criminal system. If it weren't a criminal system, then we would not, we would have been able to put a dent in the system, right? But we have never been able to put a dent, particularly since the decades of the 1970s and onward. Crime in Jamaica continues unabated. Why can't we have even a year? Superintendent, you're talking about, the senior superintendent is talking about, you know, a month in St. James without crime being registered. Why can't we have a year with just a hundred murders or, you know, we should shoot for none, but, you know, it's going to be impossible given the level of poverty that we have there, the high levels of poverty that, you know, we see in Jamaica. I think that crime and violence, you know, without crime and violence, you know, you're going to have some, registering right of um crime and violence there because the, the state is poor and because the people are so desperate they find themselves being engaged in unwholesome activities and our education system needs to be repaired it needs to be transformed <laughs> perhaps it can't be repaired at this point right so it needs to be transformed and all we have are lip service, you know, given by the, um, is lip service, I should say, given by the prime minister and his team. And they engage these, you know, people like the Orlando Pattersons and they write these, you know, reports of 300 pages and nothing happens and they get paid. They get paid to do the work that they have done. And at the end of the day, the owner of Jamaica does not benefit. And no wonder Orlando Patterson has high regards for, you know, the UN and UNESCO and all these organizations that he knows are corrupt. Right? Orlando Patterson has to know that these organizations are corrupt. And what happens is that they have these, you know, niceties, Right, they have the they make these platitudinous speeches about education and about you know democracy and about educating the rights, human rights, and all of these things that they write about. At the end of the day, the monies that have been sent to them, that have been donated by governments, by world governments, by the way, they use them to put in the pockets of these people in the higher echelons of these organizations. At the end of the day, the ordinary man and woman on the street will not benefit 
from all of these grandiose UN and UNESCO pronouncements, right? Because they are hypocrites. So we can talk all we want to talk about the United Nations and the UNESCO and all this report that we're talking about. It's not going to help us. We have to help ourselves as a people. Now, you know, this is what now the superintendent continued. After the shooting subsided, West Williams and Bennett, who were all off Upper Street addresses, were found in different parts of the community suffering from gunshot wounds. They were taken to hospital where they were pronounced dead. <laughs> very, very common words in Jamaica. They were taken to hospital where they were pronounced dead. Two firearms were seized in the aftermath. Right, so this is what happened in St. James triple murder. And the senior superintendent of police is asking, well, he's averring, he's actually intimating that the murders could have been present, could have been prevented if the citizens of the community had, you know, shared information with the police. But how can the citizens be certain of that? These are also speculation, right? We don't know if the murders would have still been averted. If Because sometimes we find that citizens do share information and nothing happens. How often have citizens called the police because they have seen some you know, strange, bizarre occurrences and nothing happens? And then you see, you hear that the person is dead. Right? So there's also another side to the story, superintendent. We've got to face up with the reality that Jamaica is a criminal state. And when we have accepted that reality, then we will see we, what the, 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 the cleavages, all of the cleavages, we will look at, we'll examine them and begin to transform them and to cut off what might have to be cut off. Right until then, make no bones about it. We can talk all we want to talk and to pretend as if we're intellectuals when we're not intellectuals, suggesting that, oh, Jamaica is not a criminal state. Right? And then people are, oh, we can't judge. Yes, you can judge. The Bible is suggesting that you should not judge if you're judging. Well, first of all, you can't judge the person's heart, his motive, because you can't read his heart. But there are things that we have been seeing that we can judge. Good judgment is something that God ordains and he condones good judgment. And we have been seeing that many people have been dying and God cannot condone death and evil. And the criminality in Jamaica is evil, right? There's no other word to describe it. And our citizens are comfortable with it because if you were not comfortable with it, you'd be crying out. But it has become a part of the Jamaican diet, the Jamaican staple. As he eats rice and peas and chicken, so is cram and balance to his, I don't know. I don't want to use the word the word soul, but cram and balance forms. It's like it's embedded in the DNA structure of Jamaicans. And not in Iran. And not in that. Nothing is wrong with it. Right? Nothing is wrong with killing. Now, there's another article I read, a letter to the editor from the beginning this morning. And the title of the, the, the editor, the title of the letter, rather, says, Too many problems plaguing Jamaica. Right? Too many problems plaguing Jamaica. And it says, it's disappointing and sad how many basic problems still exist in Jamaica in 2024, right? Basic problems. These are not big problems, though, that she could highlight. This let this writer is highlighted. Well, it's Patrick Gallimore, so it's a he. The lack of working streetlights on many major roads is glaring, right? Timely garbage collection is lacking in many towns and villages across the island. Also, drains and guile, and gullies rather, are not being cleaned frequently, and squatting is still a major problem. Scores of people are still living on the streets. The conditions of the prisons is deplorable and 
inhumane. Basic medical care seems to be in disarray. There is a lack of life-saving machines such as ventilators and other things. This is compounded by the fact that patients have to wait hours to be seen by doctors in the public hospitals, the lack of an adequate water supply infrastructure to satisfactorily meet the basic needs of many communities across the island remains an ongoing issue. The unwelcoming and very bad smell of raw sewage has become common in too many communities throughout Kingston and St. Andrew. And this is the capital, Kingston and St. Andrew, right? Maintaining law and order is another issue. It is estimated that there are over 200 criminal gangs involved in extortion, murder, robbery, and other crimes that exist in Jamaica. If Jamaica is to move from being a developing country and achieve first world status by, say, 2030, which is not going to happen, then the aforementioned problems need to be addressed urgently and comprehensively. You know, this is something that is amazing that we have been having these problems for years, right? We have been dealing with these problems and we have not been able to solve any of these problems since we have been talking about them, right? Since Jamaica became an independent country. And with, since we became an independent country, we have seen a rapid decline in law and order. There is no law and order in Jamaica. And yet we talk about development and the economy is growing. Right? And Jamaica is, re is ready to be lifted off the ground. Our macroeconomics are solid. Right? And people like the Nigel Clarks robotically tell us what he's given by the IMF and the, and the World Bank and these neoliberal institutions. He doesn't have the intellect to question what they tell him. He just simply reports it to you and he feels good about that. He stands in, par in parliament, you know, glowing. And you love to listen as slaves. You love to listen to him because it's coming from Washington, right? It's coming from Washington. So you listen to him because you're slaves and you do not possess the ability to think. So that's why these problems are not going to be solved because they also have to be solved with money. And the Jamaican economy is in shambles, right? Irrespective of what you hear from the Nigel Clarks and other men down there and the prime minister himself, the economy is in a terrible shape and it is connected to the level of crime and violence we're seeing there. On one hand, the people who are making money from the proceeds of um, crime and violence are being enriched. At the other end, we have the citizens' lives being snuffed out and nobody can say anything. Why? Because the people in higher echelons, our higher echelons of society are benefiting from it. Right? Right? And you might not think that they're benefiting directly from the snuffing out of a person's life in Frenchtown or in some parts of Montego Bay. But when you look at the grand picture and you see what is happening down there, the call centers and the drug trafficking and the human trafficking that is evident there, right? you are going to realize that it is interconnected. It is interconnected and you have to piece things together. I think the inability to piece things together is what we face in the world. People cannot really connect ideas and connect the dots. They just see things in small segments and that is what, oh, I can't say that. I can't say that. You can't say it because you can't think. But you have to, if you put the information together and you piece information together, which I find that the school system has not given many of us that ability. So we walk around pretending to be educated when we're not. Right? Because if you, at this point of Jamaica's history, you cannot safely say that this we are in a criminal society, that the entire system is built on criminality. 
Remember now that it was a slave economy. And I've said to you that the plantation model is still intact. And the plantation model was based on criminality. It was a criminal system that the British left there. And by the way, I, I understand that the Archbishop of, of England, right, is going to Jamaica to say what? Yeah? What is he going to tell us about reparations and our politicians are just drooling, right? Because they think that they can get some money. And citizens, you are not going to be a part of that reparation, whatever they're doing, right? You're not going to get any money. You're not benefiting from it. Don't be fooled by what these guys are doing and the climate change agenda and all of that stuff. All of these are interconnected and you have to connect the dots and you are going to find out very soon and you're going to be very disappointed that all of this money is not going to be of any benefit to you. It is going to remain in the pockets of the elites. It is going to remain in the pockets of the elites. Perhaps you might get a piece of the crumbs, but it's not going to be sufficient. Um, and you're going to find out that life is going to even get worse. Right? So the Archbishop of England, of the Anglican Church in England, has nothing to say to Jamaicans. Right? Because our society is even, right now, I think it's even more corrupt than <laughs> during the days of slavery. I want to think so, that our society is even now more so corrupt than during the days of slavery. I think during the days of slavery, people had a, they had a modicum of respect, of morality that we don't have right now. Because even though we complain about religion and religion should not be in schools and religion is wicked and religion is that and all of what you see. Remember now that if had it not been for religion, and the claim of morality that comes from God and the preaching of the Bible, the slavery wouldn't have ended. That was the only argument that this planters did not have any comeback for in terms of God created all men equally. Right? And then they came up with the theory of evolution. Right? They came up with the theory of evolution to suggest that scientifically, whites are superior to blacks, right? And we have ever just been following these criminal, because that's a criminal thought to, to think about it. When you think about the fact that, you know, black people are at the lower stratum of society and should remain there, right? If you go to Latin America, they have that too. And I've told you on, you know, when I did my presentation on Brazil, that in Latin America, people still talk about improving the races. Mejorar la raza. They still talk about improving the races. So if you're dark skin, you have to marry to somebody who's white or who's very light skin because you have to improve your race. Eugenics was a very much a stark reality in, in the United States, right? We're not talking much about that now because it's conspiracy theory. And how can you intelligent people spread conspiracy theory? as if slavery is not in existence, and as if, if the theory of evolution has not been the reality, has not been what is taught in schools. And many Black people go to school and believe everything that they say about the theory of evolution. No question about it. It is the science, right? So now we find ourselves at the bottom of the ladder in a criminally infested country called Jamaica. And it doesn't seem to me that anything can be done because that is how the system is designed. That is how the system is set up. Who is going to really lift these feisty black Jamaicans out of their plight, right? Nobody's going to do it because they deserve to be there. And our politicians are not going to do anything to help you because they are making money, right? and they are improving their status in society and in the world. And they like their first class, you know, travels to Washington and to Paris, right? And to London. So they're not gonna give up that sort of opportunity to speak the truth to power, right? They are not going to do that. 
So if Jamaicans are going to sit down and wait on the police and the government, well, they have to help you, but you have to demand certain conditions. You have to demand that certain conditions be met. And at this juncture of the history, the citizens of Jamaica do not trust the police. Prime Minister Andrew Holness, the citizens of Jamaica do not trust the police. Super, uh, senior superintendent, was it called Enron Samuels? Was, it that, was that his name in Montego Bay or St. James? The citizens of Jamaica do not trust the police. Right? So they are not going to be able to report things that they have seen because they cannot, they do not have the guarantee. Right? that their lives will be spared having done so. What is so hard to understand about that? Why are the police now trying to, as it were, load citizens with the guilt of not doing their job? As I'm about to end this, this video also, I need to also address the whole issue of the police, not the police, but the Jamaica Defense Force. Remember, now is it Defense Force? They are, they, they are the soldiers, the military, Jamaican military. You know, I hope that the government is rethinking now that it cannot send the military to Haiti. The Jamaican military cannot go to Haiti now, particularly after what happened after Beryl, Hurricane Beryl. Right, because we need the these uh, defense members of these defense force, the Jamaican military, to be on the streets of these um, ravaged, torn communities. Right, they should all be there protecting the citizens and their property and their possessions. Because we know now, given Jamaica's high murder rate, that you know murders happen when you have lawlessness and people are, you know, struggling. Right, so. As much as is possible, I think that the government needs to dispatch the Jamaican military to um, segments, to sections of the island, particularly those that are um, ravaged or that were ravaged by Hurricane Barrow. So in St. Elizabeth, in Manchester, in Clarendon, and other areas in St. Thomas, I understand also, I think the police, not the police, but the Jamaica Defense Force, and the police should work with them. and. If that was being done, perhaps the murder in St. James could have been averted, right? That could have been averted. And if we're having 200 gangs, as they have suggested in Jamaica, why is it that the Jamaica Defense Force, the Jamaican military, whatever you call them, what are they called again? I'm probably not sure. But why can't the Jamaican military, along with the police, you know, try to dispatch itself across the island and bring them up. Huh? Where are we going to Haiti when we have over 200 gangs in Jamaica, in a small island, a tiny island, a dot on the map? Right? A dot on the map. Why are we sending our troops to Haiti when we are having a terrible problem, perhaps worse a problem than Haiti. Well, Haiti's is, case is, is, is unique right now because of the, the fact that there is no, well, legitimate government. At least we have a legitimate government. I mean, <laughs> you know, legitimate for the purposes of legitimacy. You know, that people vote Ted and the prime minister and his team won their seats, right? But if we are, if we continue on this trajectory, on which we are currently on at the moment, I think that very soon we too are not going to have a legitimate government, right? I think we too very soon will see our governments, um, our government being fractured by the high levels of crime and violence that we see on the island. And the fact that the government doesn't want to confront the reality and to accept responsibility. What they're now telling us 
that citizens are the ones who have to join hands and hearts with them to put a dent, even though the level of confidence and trustability between citizens and police right now is at its lowest ebb, at its lowest, at its lowest point, right? Wake up, we have to wake up. Now we, we're, we're sleeping and we're fast asleep. And it seems to me that we find ourselves in a situation where perhaps at this given point, we don't even know where to start. You know, when you get up into, in the morning and your house is, you, you have left your house, perhaps dirty and everything is in disarray and you don't know where to begin. Right? You don't know where to start begin cleaning because the house is in total disarray. Almost like a storm has passed and you just don't know where to start. Yeah, like what is happening post hurricane battle. And we have had many hurricanes and earthquakes and lots of other natural disasters. And at this end, you know, I'm just using metaphorically the whole concept of disaster because the whole concept of crime and violence has been a disaster that has been plaguing Jamaica for a while, right? And it will not get better because if the truth be told, even our politicians, the police and members of the public sector do not know where to begin the cleanup. It's, and so now they're blaming other people for not being able to do their jobs effectively. But let's be truthful. Let us say that it is hard. Let us say that this is a criminal system and we need to identify the criminal elements in the criminal economy of Jamaica and break them up. When we have done that, I think that we will have a crime-free society. Thank you so much for joining. I hope that you will like and you'll share and you subscribe. Please remember to like and to share and to subscribe. And before I also end this video, let me also encourage you because YouTube, the algorithms are not promoting the videos, some of the videos I make. So yesterday I made a video on Donald Trump, Donald J. Trump attempted assassination. Please go and like the video and also subscribe and, you know, make sure that you share the video so that others can, you know, benefit from the analyses that I made in that particular video, right? Please make sure that you do that. Thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you in another one. Ciao.